Hi everyone and welcome back to the Retro Shack for what I hoped would be an interesting video not only for you all to watch but for me to make as well. You see, I got sent this Commodore VIC-20 by the lovely Paul Galt along with a few accessories, tapes and bits and bobs and unfortunately it doesn't work. Furthermore, I don't have another VIC-20 lying around, let alone a working one that I can use to swap out chips or compare things against and I figured the best way to learn about the machine would be, look, look, I'm just going to build one. <music> Here at the Shack, we'd like to give a huge thank you to the sponsor for this video, PCB Way. They help us out with all of our PCB fabrication needs and make fantastic boards at amazingly competitive prices. And it's not only PCBs that are on the menu. Apart from other fabrication services like CNC machining, 3D printing, sheet metal fabrication and injection molding, PCB Way also have a great projects library of cool stuff to build from people all around the world. Oh, and if you don't like waving a soldering iron about, they can even assemble your PCBs for you. That's the PCB way. Right, on with the show. As with before, I'm really standing on the shoulders of giants here, acting as a conduit from a bunch of parts to a hopefully working machine. The core component for all of this is the Vicky 20 mainboard designed by Bob's Bits, which is available to buy on Tindy. There's a link in the description and this board is a faithful reproduction of assembly 250403 which is a later revision and uses the 7 pin power connector rather than the 2 pin connector of the earlier models. Importantly, it's also the same revision we have in our non-working VIC-20, so if our new build works, we've got something to test against to get that one working too. This PCB also has the following enhancements from the original. An improved silk screen, adding more descriptive connector labels, chip names and clearly placed component labels. A corrected factory bodge around the video area, I have no idea what that is, haven't got there yet. Remove the need for the link wire near FB4, again we'll learn about that. Extra ground holes on DIN connectors to allow for a larger variety of replacements to be used. 9 volt AC wires that were originally connected across the board for power to the user port have been replaced with 0.6mm traces so the wires aren't required. However, if you want that authentic look, the connections are still there should you want to use them. The retro 8-bit shop had all of the standard parts and non-custom chips available and the custom chips along with the case and keyboard we located across Fleabay, Sell My Retro and Facebook Marketplace and I like to think that by gathering all these parts back together again we're at least getting one hopefully working VIC-20 that otherwise would be languishing in parts bins forevermore. Along the way we'll look at the components as we place them and we'll look into the history of the machine to see just how instrumental this machine was in paving the way for the mighty Commodore 64. Okay, so we'll be using the following tools as always. This Roycin lead free solder, a set of clippers, our trusty soldering station and a cup of tea hot enough that when used to submerge a Bamble Weenie 57 sub meson brain linked to an atomic vector plotter would get us a lovely Brownian motion producer, although that is of course infinitely improbable. It's good practice to start with the components that lie closest or flattest to the PCB in order that you're not limiting your access later on. So we'll start with our resistors and get those in place. I always double check the values prior to fitting and always check if there are any errata in the bomb. Remember that resistors such as these are not polarised but I always try to fit them in the same orientation so I don't get my brain all worked up later when I look at it. This board, like the original, doesn't have a uniform footprint size for the resistors, so some of them have had to have some creative leg bending to make sure there's a good fit to the space. Some of them, like this one, are a straight drop in, and see what I mean about orientation? Makes them all look purdy, don't it? Quick bit of soldering, and we have our first resistor fitted to the board. Yay! There are 29 of these, so let's crack on. And there we are, all the resistors in place, and we can move on to the next in the pecking order and that's these 104 capacitors of which there are about a thousand of. 
These are nicely aligned to the footprint on the board and they just drop in. And that's all of those in place too. So as we're trying to go from flattest to tallest, we'll install the rest of these caps and variable resistors, but we'll leave these taller capacitors till later in the build. And there we have all of the ceramic capacitors, standard and variable resistors on the board, and next up we'll populate the ferrite beads, or clamps as some people call them, which act as filters on the power circuit to suppress high frequency electronic noise. There are a good few of these and it didn't take long to whack them in. And at this point we seem to have done a lot of work and the board still seems empty. Let's add our sockets to take up some real estate and make it look like we've actually done something. My technique for level sockets is to secure it in place with some tape and then solder two opposite corners. It's easy then to level out the socket if needed by just heating one corner at a time while pressing the socket to the board and then you can remove the tape and solder the remaining pins and voila, a level socket. Rinse and repeat for the remaining sockets and we start to see the board coming to life and you can then easily see what bits are still left to pop in. Before we do that, time for a cup of the old brownie and motion producer and a bit of cake. So let's tackle some of the taller and larger parts now, starting with this voltage regulator and as we'll be bolting this in, we need to bend the legs in the right place so that the hole in the part lines up with the hole in the mainboard. Strictly speaking, you don't really need to bolt this in and on my non-working board and in other images I've seen, it's not, but we're going to because we're super neat and tidy. See? lovely and neat, and once it's all seated in, we'd better not forget to solder it in place. Lovely. And now on to the transistors, and this is where the really nice silk screen of this PCB is a godsend, as you really don't need to look at the bill of materials at all. Everything is clearly marked and super easy to locate. These are inductors that go into L1 and L2 on the board. They look like resistors, but they're just being sneaky. Next in is the choke, the bridge rectifier, and the crystal, and all the other non-connector type parts, leaving the board looking like this. So close, and all that's left is to pop in those non-non-connector type parts, the connectors. OK, let's see what a VIC-20 has to offer in the way of ports and connectors, starting with the cartridge port connection, which is very different from the C64. We're in more familiar territory with the video port, which is the same and can use the same video cable as the C64. The power socket is next and is also the same as the C64, and you can use the same power supply, but the VIC does draw more power, so we'll make sure to use a modern supply. The serial port is also the same as the C64. And next we have the single joystick port, which of course was increased to two on the C64, and then the power switch, which is also carried over to its younger sibling. We have the keyboard and LED headers to go in. And lastly, we have the fuse assembly, and with a bit of the old video magic, they're all in place, leaving the board complete, apart from the chips themselves. And before we fit those, let's take a look at this board compared to the original VIC-20 board, and doing so shows just how neat and tidy this looks with the more modern capacitors, instead of those big circular beige flappy ones all over the place. Also, remember that link wire at FB4 on the original board? No sign of it on the modern one, much neater. And as for the factory bodge on the original board that this modern board is supposed to fix, Still no idea what this is, so if anyone can enlighten me, please do so in the comments. Before chips go in, we're going to check that the power rail is receiving the correct voltages across the board, which should be hovering around the 5 volt mark. And that looks good to me. Right, let's pop the chips in and have a little look at them while we do it. Starting with the CPU, which is a MOS 6502 running at 1.108 MHz in this PAL configuration, or 1.02 MHz in NTSC. This is the same chip from the Commodore PET, and as we go through this we'll see more similarities with the PET, as that was the core architecture the VIC-20 was built on. 
Next is the MOS 901-486-07 kernel ROM, which is an updated version of the kernel from the PET, but with BASIC moved out to its own ROM, along with all the BASIC related operations. There's a fascinating history of the Commodore kernel by Michael Stile, which is an interesting read and the link is in the description. Here's the MOS 901-486-01, which is Commodore VIC-20 BASIC version 2 which is the updated version of the BASIC that got kicked out of the kernel. Next is the MOS 901-46003, which is the VIC-20 character ROM. The VIC uses the same character set as the PET and of course carries those PETSKI graphic characters on its keyboard too. Here are the MOS 6522 CIA chips, which are a staple of early Commodore machines and also other 6502 based micros of the day, such as the Apple III, the Oric 1 and Oric Atmos, the BBC Micro and the Apple Macintosh. Sitting proudly in centre stage is the Video Interface Chip, or VIC as it is lovingly known, or the MOS 6560 or 6561 to give it its proper name. Originally designed for low cost CRT terminals, biomedical monitors, control system displays and arcade and home video consoles, it found its way into the VIC-20 and began the dominance of Commodore over other machines for games as this chip and its successor the VIC-2 in the C64 were very advanced. The VIC was responsible for generating all video and sound in the VIC-20 and offered 16 colours, 4 sound channels, light pen support, an on-chip DMA, two 8-bit analogue to digital converters, two selectable character sizes and much more. However, the VIC-20 shipped with a total of 20k across the ROMs and only 5k of expensive SRAM. By the time the VIC had carved its chunk out, along with memory for the other ROMs, only just over 3k was available for programs without a RAM expansion. That expensive SRAM sits over here and using SRAM rather than DRAM probably explains why the VIC-20 didn't have much of it. Anyway, let's pop in the rest of the logic chips too and then fire this baby up. Always a bit nervous when first turning on something that I've put together, but here we go. Hmm. Well, looks like another cup of tea and a bit of a think is required. Well, after checking all of the solder joints to make sure I hadn't missed anything or created any bridges, everything looked good. When powering on the unit, the no signal sign disappears, so that tells me that the VIC chip is generating something. Looking online at likely culprits, it seems that a common failure that results in a blank screen is a bad kernel ROM. So let's order a new one of those. Several days later. And swap it out. This is of course the reason we socket chips rather than solder them directly to the board. It costs more but makes diagnosing issues much easier. Here goes nothing. Success! Well, that's at least one VIC-20 put together and working. I wonder if it's also a bad kernel in the original VIC-20 as I have a now known working one and that old board has been socketed previously so maybe we'll be lucky. This machine is showing it's 42 years of age but I'm still hopeful so will we see a screen? Well, no. But at least I now have a working machine to help diagnose the problem. Before we go any further, we'll be popping a heatsink onto this VIC chip as they do run quite hot and I haven't installed the metal cage around the video circuitry. I might even add an active fan to this to keep it super cool. We'll pop this new machine into its case, being careful to use the correct screws and always back turning the screws a little first to find the groove rather than carving a new channel. This case is from Germany as it's got a VC20 label rather than VIC20. VIC with a German accent could easily be confused for a very naughty German word so the marketing department at Commodore got creative and well dropped the I. Once the mainboard is screwed in place we'll connect the power LED and the keyboard connector and we're ready to go. 
One final test. Well, hello, Mr. Vic. I guess we can chalk that up to a success. So, in the next episode, we'll see if we can't now use this machine as our test bed, swapping chips out from the bad board to this and seeing what works and what doesn't. Did you have a VIC-20? Can you recommend anything that really showcases the machine so I can fully test out the build? Please leave your comments below and please consider supporting the shack so we can do more cool stuff like this. Details are on our website, which is linked in the description. Right, until next time in the shack, I'm off to have a little play on this newly built VIC-20. And until next time in the shack, it's goodbye from me.